This is May 11th, 2013 on our calendar here in the United States and the second day of Sivan 5773 on the Hebrew calendar. We're actually, um, as of today, uh, this is part 23 of the series that we've been doing, Prophecies of Messiah Yeshua. As of today, there's only one more scripture passage that we're going to be dealing with. That particular passage is probably going to take several weeks to cover because it's Daniel chapter 9. And uh, there's a lot, just like um, Isaiah 52 through 53, there was a lot to cover uh, in that particular scripture passage, same way with Daniel 9. So that will probably take uh, at least a couple weeks, if not more, just for Daniel chapter 9. And that's the last passage, scripture passage, that we'll be dealing with. However, there are some other related topics that we'll be dealing with before we're finished with, completely finished with the series, uh, that we will do after that. So, we're, we still have several weeks of teaching on this particular issue, but we're getting real close to being done with the, the actual scripture passages, okay? Today we're going to be dealing with three passages. Two passages from Tehillim, Psalms, and one from Mishle'i, from Proverbs. We're going to do things a little differently. We're going to go in backwards order. Because really in dealing with these particular passages, they kind of build on one another. So we're going to start, actually start with the, the passage in Proverbs uh, first, which is Mishle'i, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's going to be page 989. So verse 4 of chapter 30. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has cupped the wind in the palms of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Now we want to, I want to back up to verse 1 because verse 1 tells us this is not Solomon. You know, a lot of the Proverbs are attributed to Solomon. Solomon is not the author of this particular proverb chapter. This says, the words of Agur, the son of Yaqeh. Now note, note what he says, the prophecy. So he understands that he is giving a prophecy with this chapter. Okay? Now obviously in this verse, these first, there's, there's a total of six questions that are being asked in this verse. And the first four are rhetorical. Because everyone knows who has gone up to heaven and come down, who has cupped the wind in the palms of their hands. They're talking about Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh. 
Number five, question number five is easy. Which is, what is his name? Because the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been revealed long before the writing of the book of Proverbs, of Mishle'i. And so, they knew that his name was yod heh vav -Heh. The sixth question, however, is a mystery at the writing of this particular proverb. Could it be possibly that yod heh vav -Heh had actually revealed the name of the Messiah to Agur. We don't know because Agur doesn't indicate that in his writing. But for him to ask the question, what is his son's name, surely you know, would indicate that possibly he did know. Now that would be very unusual because there's not been anyone else who has ever claimed to have known the name of the Son of God until we read in the Gospels where the angel comes and reveals that information to Yeshua's mother. And so it would be very interesting to know that, but there's not any, not any way that we can. Now, we had already established that yod heh vav -Heh had a son back when we dealt with Tehillim, um, Psalms chapter 2. We did this last week. We dealt with this. Chapter 2, and in verses 7 and 12. In verse 7, yod heh vav -Heh says, I will proclaim the decree. Adonai said to me, you are my son. Today I became your father. And then in verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish along the way. When suddenly his anger blazes, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so we had already established and not only with that, but pr other passages that we had dealt with, that this child was going to be born. But this very, that passage in chapter 2 of the Psalms is very specific in identifying the fact that yod heh vav -Heh has a son. And now we're being challenged by this particular author in Proverbs to know his name. Now we move backwards back to Tehillim Psalms and I want you to turn to chapter 110. We're going to read the entire chapter <clears throat> to begin with, and then we're going to back up and break it down. A Psalm of David. So we very clearly have identified here who the author of this psalm is. This is David writing. Now, this is the way this uh, particular um, translator, uh, David Stern, translates. Adonai says to my Lord. If you have a different translation, it more than likely says, the Lord said to my Lord. Okay? Instead of saying Adonai. Anyway, it says, Adonai says, 
to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Adonai will send your powerful scepter out from Zion, so that you will rule over your enemies around you. On the day your forces mobilize, your people willingly offer themselves in holy splendors from the womb of the dawn. The dew of your youth is yours. Adonai has sworn it, and he will never retract. You are a Kohen, a priest, forever, to be compared with Malkitzedek. Adonai at your right hand will shatter kings on the day of his anger. He will pass judgment among the nations, filling it with dead bodies. He will shatter heads throughout an extensive territory. He will drink from a stream as he goes on his way. Therefore, he will hold his head high. Now, these last few verses actually kind of go along with what I was saying in my commentary on the Torah portion. But that deals with the second coming of the Messiah. And what we want to look at are verses 1 through 4. Because that has to do with the first coming. Now here's, here's what we need to understand from the wording of this particular passage. God had caused David, as we know, if, we, if you read in uh, Samuel and in the Kings and Chronicles, you know that God had caused David to be successful at every encounter that he had when going out to battle against other nations. And he was able, during his reign, to subjugate all of the nations that surrounded Israel and actually required them to pay tribute to Israel. Okay, so in reality, in this realm of existence, David didn't have anybody that was higher than him. He didn't have a Lord that was over him. And so for him to write in this psalm, Adonai says to my Lord, you then begin to have to ask the question, who is David talking about? If he didn't have someone over him in this physical realm, who is this that he is calling my Lord? In fact, this verse says this in Hebrew. Naum yod he vav he la Adoni. So it very clearly states that this first name or this first person that is called the Lord said to my Lord, the first the Lord is yod he vav he. Okay? So this is God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But clearly the second word, it's not saying yod he vav he said to yod he vav he. It says yod he vav he said to another distinct personality. Okay? La Adoni. My, my Lord. Okay? So who is the Lord of whom David is speaking? Well, obviously, it's the Mashiach. And if it is the Mashiach, then that tells us that David had an understanding, a deep understanding of Mashiach prior to Mashiach actually ever existing as a human being on the planet. Way before Yeshua. Okay? And so... If indeed this is the Father speaking to the Son, set at my right hand. 
until I make your enemies your footstool. Who is it that was invited to sit at the Father's right hand? Yeshua. Now what you have to understand about this particular statement is that the, this is an ancient custom that, well, I can't say is not practiced today, but not commonly practiced, certainly not here in the United States, okay? If someone is a favored guest or whatever, you might just out of um, courtesy to them, in honor of them, you might place them on the right hand if you're sitting down to a table or something of that nature. There's still a little bit of that left over in the society. But that's, that is a convention that for the most part is not followed. This means way more than just honoring. Okay? This particular custom, anyone who is seated to the right of the king was considered to be equal with the king. Okay? We have evidence of this particular custom found in 1 Kings, Malachim Aleph, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Malachim Aleph, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. It says, So Bathsheba, or Bathsheba, went to King Shlomo to speak to him on behalf of Adoniah. The king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat down on his throne and had a throne set up for the king's mother so that she sat at his right. Okay? This was for, for the king to have a throne placed at his right and then to seat someone in it was an indication of recognition of equality. And so for yod he vav he to say, I am saying to you, come sit at my right hand. It is yod he vav he saying, I see you as my equal. Well, there's only one person who could be regarded as an equal to yod he vav he And that is the son. This, the term we, we read on, the term where it says that he's going to make the enemies, make your enemies your footstool, this has to do with the idea behind this is humbling. Until these people who are taking a position of pride before you are humbled and have to bow before you, then this is going, you're going to sit at my right hand. Okay? Who, who is it that this is speaking about? This isn't enemies as in, necessarily as in all of the nations and so on who rebelled against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is speaking directly to the Messiah. Who are Messiah's enemies when he was alive? The religious leadership. And so the Father is saying until the religious leadership humbles themselves before you. You're going to sit at my right hand. 
Now that carries over into obviously the leadership of Israel at the time of the Messiah. They're not alive any longer. But they are represented nevertheless genetically in the people of Israel that exist today. And we know that the Messiah made the statement to Jerusalem as he looked over Jerusalem. He said, you're not going to see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That requires them to humble themselves to the point of being able to make that statement. And until, they're, until they humble themselves and call that out as a people, we're not going to see him. Okay? That's one of, the, one of the reasons, you know, and I've, I've shared these kinds of things with you before. One of the reasons why I can say with all certainty that when people come out and say the Messiah is going to come on such and such a date this year, I can tell you that is absolutely not true. Because Yeshua himself, before he left, said, You will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. So until the Jewish people say that, we are not going to see the Messiah again. Those are his own words. Okay? And just like his father, he doesn't make idle statements. He doesn't go back on what he says. Okay? If he said that, that's exactly what he means. So when people say, well, the Messiah could come at any time, I say, no, that is absolutely not true. There are some things that according to the scripture and according to the words of the Messiah must take place first. Must be fulfilled. Now, could it happen in an instant? Yes. It could be happening right now. The people, without us knowing, the people of Israel could be saying, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, right now. Okay? Not likely. But until that happens, we're not seeing the Messiah. And so, according to what is being said here by the Father to the Messiah, this is a limited time thing. Okay, it has, it has an ending point of him sitting at the right hand of the Father. Until, okay, until I make your enemies your footstool. And so, this refers to those who rejected Yeshua at his first coming. And another clue is found in verse 2. Because we've already, it's already been identified in verse 1, until I make your enemies your footstool. Then in verse 2, he says, Adonai will send your powerful scepter out from Zion, so that you will rule over your enemies around you. The identification of Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, clearly identifies that the enemies that are being talked about are in Israel, the people in Israel, okay? Now the last thing that we want to look at in this particular passage that we're dealing with is verse 4. And we need to have a discussion about this. Especially for the sake of those of you who have already purchased, because I understand some of you have gone out and purchased the book that I've been taking my messages from, Messianic Christology. And that's great. That's wonderful. I'm glad you've done that. 
but the way that Fruchtenbaum treats this particular passage, I am in direct opposition to what he has to say on this particular verse, okay? This verse says, Adonai has sworn it, and he will never retract. You are a Kohen forever to be compared with Malkitzedek. Why, why is Yeshua being compared to Malkitzedek? It's, it identifies him as a priest like Malkitzedek. The reason why he's being compared to Malkitzedek is because Malkitzedek is the only priest in the scripture that's identified as also being a king. Okay? There's not any other priest in history that was also a king other than Malkitzedek. And so Yod Heh Vav Heh, the father, is saying to him, you are going to be a priest forever before me in the same way as Malki Tzedek, Tzedek, because you are also going to be king. Okay. Now what, what Arnold Fruchtenbaum has to say about this particular passage is that he, is, he says the only way that this can be true of the Messiah is that when the Messiah came and he died on the cross, he totally obliterated the Mosaic law and completely did away with it. Yeah. So I have a big problem with that interpretation and with that idea. The reason why he says that, and I understand his logic, the logic is God established a particular type of priesthood by command, by law of God, that was to function in a particular way with certain people in certain positions. And therefore, the only reason or the only way that the Messiah could be this kind of priest, which is completely different than the priesthood set up under the Mosaic Covenant, is to have to do away with the Mosaic Covenant in order for Messiah to fulfill this particular role. I disagree. Messiah, although when he was here on the earth and a human being subjected himself to the, Mo the parameters of the Mosaic Law, he is nevertheless outside of that law because he is the creator of that law. He is God in the flesh. Okay? And so for him to fulfill a role that is assigned to him by the Father, he is not required to fulfill that role within those, only those parameters set forth by God for the people of the earth. Okay? His priesthood is going to be completely different. His priesthood actually exists, according to Ezekiel and the other prophets that write about the third temple, his priesthood actually exists at the same time that the Mosaic priesthood exists. They're going on simultaneously. The scripture tells us that as Messiah is sitting on the throne in the temple, that the high priest that has been assigned to that task at that time, it says that the high priest and the Messiah will have a special relationship with one another. But that tells us that there is a high priest according to the Mosaic law it can't be done away with. Otherwise, there's not going to be a third temple. There's not going to be everything Ezekiel tells us about 
if the Mosaic Covenant has been obliterated. So, I, I obviously am very passionately against the whole idea of the Mosaic Law being done away with. Now, obviously, there are some elements, some elements that have been changed. The laws of sin and death, it says, were crucified with Yeshua on the cross. And also, because of, because of the fact that the temple was destroyed, the priesthood can't function in Jerusalem anymore, things have changed as a result of that. Okay? But it doesn't mean that God has completely done away with all of that because the Messiah died. And we need to be very clear on that issue and not go down that path. You had a the original comment. king of Israel was God himself. Right. And they wanted another king like the other nations. Yes. It's going back to the original king. Yes. Structure. That's the way... It's going back to what it was supposed to be. And of course we, we know there is a diagram. What book is it in? Is it uh, um, uh, Growing to Maturity? No. The Church, Israel, in the Last Days. A diagram that was drawn by uh, Dan Jester. It basically shows history like a V. And, and we start at Adam and Chava and we make this decline until we get to Yeshua. And Yeshua is the pivot point, the changing point. At that point, then everything begins to go back up again. Because the whole point of what Yeshua did was to restore back to its original form what God started with. Okay? And so progressively through history since Yeshua, we are seeing the restoration of various things throughout history. And ultimately, obviously, it's not Yeshua's design for there to be an earthly priesthood. That is an interim thing that's going on. Once we get to the end of the thousand years and Hasatan and the demons are dealt with and all the wicked people are dealt with, the Bible doesn't tell us what happens after that. But I guarantee you there will not be a need for a priesthood any longer. There will not be a need for any kinds of sacrifices any longer. For any reason. And I know people ask the question of me, why is there going to be a third temple? Why are, are is there any kind of animal sacrifices reinstituted? Why are we doing this? Again. Because Yeshua came and he took care of all of our sins and etc., etc. What most people don't understand is that many of the sacrifices that were commanded to be made were actually not specifically for the sin of a person, but they were for the sake of sanctifying and cleansing the temple itself or the tabernacle itself and all of the articles and so on that existed there that had to remain holy. It, it even tells us that in the scripture. It says that when on Yom Kippur when uh, Aharon is to come before the Lord 
it, it talks about you'll make this sacrifice and that sacrifice and you're going to sprinkle blood on this item and that item and so on to remove the taint from the tabernacle and all of its items because people are coming and going from this place. And the sin is in the person. And they are, by, by coming in contact with things, they are tainting everything that they touch, everything that they're close to. They're tainting because of sin. During the millennial kingdom, there's still going to be sin. And sinful people will be coming up to the temple to worship God. They will be bringing their sinful taint with them into the temple compound. It will be necessary to cleanse the temple on a regular basis to keep it in a state of holiness. But once that thousand years is done, everything changes. There will no longer be an issue with sin. Sin's gone. Period. The last passage that we're going to look at today. And, and now you'll understand why we went backwards. Is Tehillim Psalms chapter 80. Verses 15 through 18, if you have a complete Jewish Bible, if you have a different translation, verses 14 through 17. The context of this particular passage, this, this is the people of Israel calling out to God for help. This is a cry for help. A cry of save us. And it's, the wording is very interesting. Remember I said in my commentary that this term Adonai Tzvaot or the term captain of the hosts is applied to Yeshua. Okay? Prior to Yeshua coming in human form, there, the people of Israel had encounters with the captain of the hosts. We have recorded in Yehoshua, Joshua, that Joshua encountered the pre-incarnate Yeshua as the captain of the hosts. It says he comes, Yehoshua has gone out, they're about to have a battle, He's gone out to be by himself. And while he's out by himself praying, this man comes up to him. Identified as the captain of the hosts. And Yehoshua asks him the question, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the captain of the host says, no. In other words, you're asking the wrong question. Because this isn't about being for you or for them. This is about being for God. Okay. But Yehoshua has an encounter with the pre-incarnate Yeshua. So in this passage, we, we begin with God of armies. Please come back. Isn't that interesting? Captain of the hosts, pre-incarnate Yeshua, please come back. Look from heaven. See and tend this vine. Protect what your right hand planted. The sun you made strong for yourself. Now he's talking to God. It is burned by fire. It is cut down. They perish at your frown of rebuke. Help the man 
at your right hand, the Son of Man you made strong for yourself. This is prophetically speaking about, yet again, about the time when the Messiah will come back again. This particular one has elements from both comings, or a reference. The fact that you say to someone, please come back, that means they were here before. Okay? So please come back. This is confirmational of the passages, the two passages that we just dealt with. But it very clearly talks about, in verse 18, help the man at your right hand. What did we say about being at the right hand? That means equality with God. So they're crying out to God, help this man, and it's clearly a man, it's not a spirit, it's a man that is equal to you. The Son of Man, which as you know when you read through the Gospels, Yeshua was referred to and referred to himself over and over as the Son of Man. Okay, that was, a, that was a, an identifying term used for him. The Son of Man you made strong for yourself. You made strong for yourself, since we're talking prophetically, is speaking of the strength that was in Yeshua when he had to deal with the whole issue of giving his own life on behalf of all people and all sin. And so, here we have in these three passages the clear identification that number one, yod heh vav -Hey has a son. Number two, yod heh vav -Hey has chosen to seat this son at his right hand, giving him equal status with himself. And that this status, or not the status, but the position of sitting is limited until those who rebelled or were rebellious against the Son are caused to be humbled. And that humbling will, take, will be manifest by the cry Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. That is when we will know that the people of Israel have been humbled to the point that God says, now I can send my son. Like I said, next week, we will be dealing with Daniel chapter 9, which is full of very detailed information in regards to the Messiah. Both first coming and second coming prophecies. All right, let's pray. Abba, my prayer today, as we have dealt with very clear passages, Father, is that you will remove the blinders from my people Israel. Father, that they will be able to look 
at these very clear passages and see them for what they are with their own eyes. Father, we understand from your word that the blindness, the, the impart blindness that exists was placed upon your people by you. And it was to serve a purpose. It was to allow the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, to come to faith. But Father, now we cry out to you. Remove the blinders. That your people may be able to see who Mashiach really is. That they might be able to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, in regards to Yeshua. So that we might see the Messiah return. Abba, we long for the return of the Messiah. May it happen in our days, in our lifetime, soon. And we cry out from this place, Baruch Baba Shem Adonai, and Moran Atah Adon Yeshua. Come quickly, Lord Yeshua. I pray these things, Bashem Yeshua, in the name, in the authority, in the reputation of Yeshua. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'ikunecha Yisra In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.